around my neighborhood, there's quite a few of those free libraries, and I found quite a few treasures from these, including nearly half of the Saga comics, and I really recommend this series. <laughs> oh my god, it's so good. Fashion magazines from the 80s. This is certainly aesthetic. And the subject of today's video, Garden State on DVD. This ain't no Blu-ray. It's 2005, and this is cool as hell. In fact, this movie was released in 2004, written and directed and even starring Zach Braff, best known for the hospital sitcom Scrubs. I've seen this movie during the right time of my life, when you're supposed to, about late teens, early 20s, as the movie itself features characters at that age facing the brink of adulthood and coming to terms with real responsibilities, things that I'm still avoiding to this day. I unbuttoned my shirt. As a pitchfork media worshipping hipster, this movie resonated with my soul and became my personality for a time. I want to apologize for all my friends who knew me during this time. These days, I do not feel as nostalgic for it as I used to, but I do recognize that it's still a well-made movie overall. For a first-time director, Zack proved himself capable with a strong vision. He knew exactly what he wanted his movie to be, right down to the soundtrack that will totally change your life. Zach plays Andrew Largeman, who is an actor out in L.A. that returns to his hometown in New Jersey to attend the funeral of his mother. During his return, he reconnects with his old friends. Fucking De Niro and shit. It's like uh, Jersey's De Niro and shit. And makes a new one while waiting for a doctor's appointment. This new friend is Sam, played by Natalie Portman. And at this point in the video, I can go no further without saying it. I'm going to say the word. The trope. Manic Pixie Dream Girl. If you don't know what that is, it's basically a perky, not like other girls type of character that helps a brooding young man rediscover the secrets of life and what it means to be alive. I'm like quirky. This term was coined by critic Nathan Rabin in his review for Elizabethtown, but uh, Natalie Portman's character is also mentioned in that same article. In fact, Garden State and Elizabethtown are often brought up together because of the similarities with their storylines. They were also released within about a year of each other. Zach plays Andrew, Orlando Bloom plays Drew, and they both are returning to their hometown for a funeral of a dead parent. However, I personally don't believe Cameron Crowe was trying to rip off the success of Garden State. It's one of those coincidences that occasionally happens from time to time. The first example that pops into my brain is Armageddon and Deep Pen Pact. And much like those movies, these movies have very drastic different tones. Zach Braff's vision is much more personal and low-key. Uh, Cameron Crowe's is very sentimental, uh, like a Hallmark card. Garden State is NPR World Cafe. Elizabethtown is classic rock that really rocks. <laughs> Now, when we compare the two Pixies, Kirsten Dunst as Claire is far more one-dimensional than Natalie Portman's Sam. This isn't a problem. There's a place for characters who have one pony in their bag of tricks. Usually it's sitcoms, which are linear to a fault, and that's all they need to be. I want him to die. Hello, sweetness. Ladies. However, it does become a problem when that character is a romantic lead in a feature-length movie. We should be able to fall in love with the love interest, as the protagonist does, but if they don't seem human, that is impossible. Another reason why Sam seems less superficial than Claire is because of Natalie Portman's commitment to the character and her performance. Claire comes off that way because she is... There's really nothing else to her other than helping Drew get over his dead dad. She even says, 
I can't help helping. <laughs> and that's the only reason why she exists. With Sam, we do get a glimpse of her home life, so I do know she can't exist without brooding ass Andrew. One last thing about Manic Pixie Dream Girls promise. The man who is behind the term has since apologized for its creation. What was once intended to be used to call out the sexless culture of men writing reductive roles for women has been used against women who have the audacity to have blue anime hair and a bubbly personality. Honestly, I'm glad to see this trend go out of fashion. Movies like Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, and 500 Days of Summer, which stars heavyweight manic pixie dream girl herself, Zoe De Chanel, took a golden knife to the heart of this trope, and I say good fucking riddance. So, 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 back to the movie. The whole reason why Andrew was in that waiting room was to see a doctor about these headaches that he gets that he describes as random jolts of pain. We hear the laundry list of medications that he's been prescribed by his father, who is also his psychiatrist. And the Paxil, Zoloft, Selexa, Depakote? Obviously, that's a problem. His doctor offers him some scripts that he forgot to pack, which he declines. And now, it's easy to interpret the message of this movie on medications as, you don't need drugs. Just be happy. Thanks. I'm cured. However, I don't think that is the case. It seems like Andrew truly doesn't have any conditions and that the, the drugs he was wrongly prescribed were attempts to control him by his father. As someone who takes meds for my own issues, I kind of took this seriously. So I did some digging and I found an ancient blog of Zach Braff's where he does say that he is not anti-medication and going cold turkey is a bad idea. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt because personally I like to believe that not everything characters say or do are necessarily reflective of their creator's own convictions. Now what about the rest of the movie? Isn't there, what about the rest of the movie? From here onward the movie continues in a meandering pace while serving to deepen the portrait on Andrew's character. The whole point is that Andrew is a sad man who has been passive throughout his whole life, letting it slip by before its very eyes, not allowing himself to feel anything. This comes to a head when he literally screams at the void while Simon and Garfunkel play in the background. What led up to this release of emotion and only CGI shot in the movie was a fetch quest led by Peter Sargad's character, Mark, a pot-smoking slacker who robs graves. This tail end of the film slightly redeems him, however, as he takes our two lovebirds through the seedy underbelly of suburbia, including a peep show run by Method Man to retrieve a locket that belonged to Andrew's mother. Method Man was nervous about saying titties in front of Natalie Portman. Hold up! Hold up! Who here just saw some titties? Raise your hand if you just saw some titties. I think that's kind of interesting. All this leads up to the conclusion where Andrew has his aha moment of realization and decides to stay in Jersey instead of simply returning to LA and assuming everything's going to be all right. He has accepted that he should allow himself to feel whatever it is that life has in store for him, whether that's happiness or sorrow. Good for him. So, would I recommend Garden State? Yes. As a teen, I did enjoy this movie, and if you are a teenager, you're probably not watching my channel at all, but if you just so happen to be, give this movie a shot, maybe it'll speak to you. The production design is good, there's a couple of interesting shots, and the screenplay has an occasional insightful gem here or there. Even though I do not have the same fondness for this movie as I did when I was younger, I still recognize that it is, overall, a well-made movie. To put it simply, TLDR, it's not a great movie, but a good one, and yes, I fucking love the soundtrack.